Good afternoon. Good afternoon, all the people here present today. We open, we're here by open the 15th hearing of the 184th period of session of the commission, which uh, whose title is recommend follow up of recommendation of nine um, merits report and different sentences related to the death row in the US, which was requested by the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. I would like to greet our president, Julissa Mantilla. Uh, sorry, I would like to say I'm on behalf of Julissa Mantilla, who cannot be today here due to a medical appointment. I am Stuart de Rolon, I the first vice pres president of the commission, and I will be presiding over this hearing. And today I am joined by Commissioner Joel Hernandez, Commissioner Roberta Clark, and here we also have the Executive Secretary for Monitoring, Maria Claudia Polido, and the uh, and Jorge Mesa. This hearing has as a purpose to follow up the recommendations of the Commission issued in nine merits report and 18 precautionary measures on people um, sentenced to death in the US of people who remain in the death row wait, waiting for their execution. The hearing joins two mechanisms uh, for the hearing, the cases and the precautionary measures mechanisms. Um, the commission expresses its hopes that this hearing will open a dialogue between the parties who promote the compliance of the recommendations which were issued in this merits report and in these precautionary measures. Likewise, the Commission would like to promote um, strategies for the follow-up of the recommendations followed in this hearing and announces hereby that the hearing will allow us to uh, reinforce the strategy, the follow-up strategy of these decisions. I would like to read the representatives of the state and the civil society, and I would also like to explain how time will be allocated. We will have first 20 minutes, which will be used by the representatives of the victims and beneficiaries. Afterwards, the estate would also have 20 minutes to intervene, to in, and then we will have 20 minutes by the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, and then we will have 12 minutes for comments by the representatives of the beneficiaries and 12 minutes by comments from the state, and I am going to close with comments by the commission. I would like to reach you now, and I would like to give the floor to the representatives of the victims and beneficiaries. They have 20 minutes. You may use the floor now. Thank you, Commissioner Rolon. Good afternoon, distinguished commissioners, vice president, assistant executive secretary, and representatives of the state. My name is Anita Sinha. I'm an associate professor of law and director of the International Human Rights Law Clinic at American University, Washington College of Law. My role is, in, is to introduce the representatives of petitioners who will present today. We have coordinated amongst ourselves to address common themes across our cases. Our intent is to highlight global issues concerning the death penalty and death row in the United States, and we will submit both case-specific and global recommendations in writing following this hearing. I will introduce the full list of representatives now in the order in which they will present. First, we will hear from Francisco Serrano, son of petitioner Nelson Serrano, who is currently on death row in Florida. We will then hear from Therese Michelle Day, chief of the Capitol Habeas Unit in the Office of the Federal Public Defender for the District of Arizona, and Jordan Berman, assistant federal public defender in the Office of the Federal Public Defender for the Southern District of Ohio. Ms. Day and Mr. Berman's remarks will focus on the issues related to serious mental illness. Next will be Mark Marr, who is a staff attorney with the non-governmental organization Reprieve. Mr. Marr's remarks will include the application of the 1963 Vienna Convention on Consular Relations in cases involving foreign nationals. Last for this opening segment will be remarks from Juan Carlos Vega, 
representative of petitioner Victor Saldano. Our final remarks after the time allocated to the state and distinguished commissioners will be given by Jonathan Amnoff, Deputy Federal Public Defender with the Office of the Federal Public Defender for the Central District of California, and Cesare Romano, Professor of Law at Loyola Law School, Los Angeles. Our last prepared remarks will be from Sandra Babcock, Clinical Professor of Law at Cornell Law School. And so with that, Mr. Serrano, I yield to you. Thank you. My father, Nelson Serrano, is the oldest person on Florida's death row at 84 years of age and has spent the last 20 years of his life incarcerated. I have created the opportunities to talk to ex-wardens and prison guards over the past two decades to verify that mistreatment of prisoners is the norm. Culturally, systemically, it is acceptable practice for guards to also be tormentors of mind, body, and soul of these inmates, especially on death row. My father has ailments related to age, malnutrition, and medical neglect. These conditions are sufferance enough, but exasperated by the lack of medical attention, and if received, the poor quality medical care delivered by a system without oversight. While incarcerated, my father lost his eyesight in one eye and is losing his eyesight in the other from macular degeneration. My father's only occupation is to keep his sanity, which he does through reading more than a thousand books, responding to letters and emails, playing games and watching TV and movies all activities that use his one good eye, a treatable condition with over-the-counter meds that he gets but sporadically while guards taunt him that he won't know what's coming once he becomes totally blind. He's almost completely deaf. He waited almost three years to get his last hearing aids fixed. He has heart disease for the last 20 years, but in the last 20 months, that heart medication was not given to him three times, each for a period of several weeks. He did not know if he was going to die or wake up in the morning when he did not have his medication. On top of that, he's been waiting for dentures for more than five years. Since then, every morning he takes string from his uniform and ties his teeth together so he can chew. And then every night he cuts that string, removes his teeth so he doesn't swallow them during the night. Put that with high blood pressure, prostate cancer. He needs a hip replacement, osteoporosis, and this is his medical condition. But this is where I wanna talk about the ADA. Where is the federal enforcement? The Florida Department of Corrections lost a lawsuit in Disability Rights Florida versus Julie Jones, Secretary of the DOC in 2016, where plaintiffs sued defendant alleging a widespread pattern of failures to comply with the American Disabilities Act, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, the Eighth Amendment and the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. After substantial litigation, the parties reached a comprehensive settlement agreement in 2016, where the DOC was gonna make sweeping changes in the way it treats its prisoners who are deaf, hard of hearing, blind, have low vision, or have mobility impairments. For over two years, the plaintiffs worked with the defendant to assist with the implementation of these requirements. However, the defendant, even though he had a substantial amount of time to come into compliance, failed to do so in numerous ways. Florida prisoners with physical disabilities are still suffering from lack of accommodations, aids and services, and are still being excluded from DOC programs, services and activities like going outside because of their disabilities. The DOC has substantially breached their settlement agreement and the plaintiff therefore filed another lawsuit seeking specific performance. The DOC lost that second lawsuit in 2020, but in all of this time, where was the federal enforcement of the ADA? All of these are horrid examples of human rights violations committed by Americans against Americans. They need to stop. Prisons, medical contractors, and ADA compliance needs human rights oversight with enforcement authority, or else we can't call ourselves the protector of human rights, justice, and democracy. That's what I came to say. I thank you all for hearing. My name is Therese Day. I'm an assistant federal public defender for the District of Arizona. I'm here today on behalf of my client, Pete Rogovich, a prisoner who's been housed on Arizona's death row for 27 years, the majority of which have been spent in solitary confinement. Mr. Rogovich suffers from schizoaffective disorder, a serious mental illness, which is a combination of schizophrenia and manic depression. The seriously mentally ill are the most vulnerable persons who've been sentenced to death. Their diseases are generally associated with hallucinations, delusions, disorganized thoughts, and significant disturbances in consciousness, perception, and memory. These symptoms can cause severe impairment in major areas of functioning, 
such as cognitive capabilities, normal developmental processes, vocational capacity, and social relationships. Like persons who have intellectual disabilities and juveniles, persons with serious mental illness do not possess the culpability necessary to place them among the narrow category of those who are eligible for the death penalty. The characteristics of people with serious mental illness also increase the likelihood of wrongful execution and make it unlikely that the penological interest of deterrence and retribution can be served by the imposition of the death penalty because of their reduced moral culpability. As the commission found in its published merits report for Mr. Rogovich, the execution of a person with a mental disability not only violates international law, but is particularly cruel, inhuman, and degrading. The European Union has likewise declared that the execution of persons suffering from any form of mental disorder is contrary to internationally recognized human rights norms and neglects the dignity and worth of the human person. There is currently momentum in the United States to eliminate the death penalty as a sentencing option for this category of people. The American Bar Association has for over 15 years maintained that the death penalty does not serve any effective or appropriate penological purpose when it is applied to persons with serious mental illness. Similarly, every major mental health association in the United States has urged eliminating the death penalty as a sentencing option for persons with serious mental illness, including the American Psychiatric Association, the American Psychological Association, and the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill. There have also been efforts in state legislatures across the country to abolish the death penalty as a sentencing option for persons with serious mental illness. Two states, Ohio and Kentucky, have enacted legislation, and bills were introduced in a number of other states, including South Dakota, Tennessee, Missouri, North Carolina, Texas, Arkansas, Virginia. That would exempt persons with serious mental illness from the death penalty. Given this national movement, the time is ripe for Congress to consider eliminating the death penalty for persons with serious mental illness. The representatives of the federal government who are present today are in the position to encourage the Biden administration to propose federal legislation that would eliminate the death penalty as a sentencing option for defendants with serious mental illness who are charged with federal capital crimes. The Biden administration has been a beacon of hope for marginalized persons by, by promoting that all people should be treated with dignity and humanity. Federal legislation eliminating the death penalty for these vulnerable persons would serve as a model for state legislatures to do the same. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you to the commission. My name is Jordan Berman. I am an assistant federal public defender for the Southern District of Ohio. I'm here on behalf of my client, Samuel Moreland, an inmate on Ohio's death row. Even though this commission had already granted precautionary measures on his behalf, the Ohio Supreme Court nonetheless recently granted the state's motion to set his execution date. At the same time, however, uh, as Ms. Day mentioned, Ohio has become the first state in the country, now followed by Kentucky, to pass a law prohibiting the death penalty for those with serious mental illness. The Ohio legislature passed this law with overwhelming bipartisan support, as well as with the support of major mental health organizations, faith groups, and various public officials. Ohio's law requires a diagnosis of schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder, or delusional disorder, and the person seeking relief must show that at the time of the alleged aggravated murder, the serious mental illness significantly impaired the person's capacity to exercise rational judgment in relation to the person's conduct with respect to either conforming the conduct to the requirements of the law or appreciating the nature, consequences, or wrongfulness of the person's conduct. Mr. Moreland, who has been diagnosed with both, both schizophrenia and delusional disorder, is in the midst of litigating his claim for relief under this law. The law has been in effect since April 2021 and provided current death row inmates with one year in which to file a petition seeking relief. While I heard predictions that every death row inmate would attempt to get relief, in the end, less than one third of them actually filed. And many of those petitions will likely be withdrawn or negotiated prior to further judicial proceedings. In other words, there does not appear to be a great strain on judicial resources. 
At this point, only three individuals have been removed from death row under this law and resentenced to life without the possibility of parole. All three were not contested by the local prosecutor. This commission has recognized that the imposition of the death penalty for a person with serious mental illness violates the right not to be subjected to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment recognized in Article 26 of the American Declaration. The US officials on this call should encourage the Biden administration to propose legislation prohibiting the death penalty for federal inmates with serious mental illness, or at least to develop Justice Department policy declaring such persons ineligible for the death penalty. The United States has already prohibited the death penalty for those less culpable, such as juveniles and those with intellectual disabilities, and the same prohibition is required here. Good afternoon, and thank you to the commission. My name is Mark Mayer. I'm here on behalf of petitioner Linda Carty. I'm also speaking on behalf of Amy Knight, who is here on behalf of petitioner Ronaldo Ibarra. The state should take further steps to ensure compliance with this commission's recommendations regarding violations of Article 36 of the Vienna Conventions on Consular Relations, which the commission has recognized as a component of the fair trial rights of foreign nationals. The International Court of Justice in Avena recognized that the United States must provide review and reconsideration of convictions and sentences where the authorities have failed to notify a detainee of the rights under Article 36 of the VCCR. Despite this decision, the United States Supreme Court precedent has made domestic enforcement of Article 36 difficult. We appreciate the efforts the state has taken to ensure enforcement, for example, by including Avena implementation in its budget proposal for fiscal year 2022. We encourage the state to push aggressively for congressional legislation to ensure affected foreign nationals receive the review to which they are entitled. Additionally, we, aware, we are aware that the state has developed a guide for local officials regarding their notification obligations under Article 36. We welcome and applaud these efforts, but they do not go far enough. The recommendations of this commission relate to past violations and the state's efforts to educate local officials about their notification obligations do not repair these past violations. We are not aware of any case before the commission in which the state has conceded that an Article 36 violation was prejudicial or of any steps taken to implement the commission's recommendations to repair violations in completed cases. While we do not expect the state to concede prejudice in every case, we encourage the state to approach these cases dispassionately and to objectively evaluate whether petitioners' fair trial rights have been violated through non-compliance with Article 36 of the VCCR. There are other actions the state could take to ensure compliance with this commission's recommendations. For example, the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty, or EDPA's, state procedural bars severely limit the federal judiciary's ability to recognize and remedy violations of Article 36. By eliminating or, or easing these bars, the state will ensure that more foreign nationals receive the review and reconsideration to which they are entitled by giving federal courts greater ability to recognize and remedy these violations of Article 36. Additionally, the state could request to appear as amicus curiae in state court cases where Article 36 has been violated. The US government's position carries great weight with state courts in interpreting international law, and it can be decisive in persuading states to adhere to their, to their obligations under international law. Finally, it is important to note what is at stake here is not just compliance with the commission's recommendations for compliance sake. These are life and death decisions. Both the American Declaration and the United States Constitution agree that states may not take life without a fair trial and the due process of law. If the state is devoted to human rights and compliance with the American Declaration, it will take steps to remedy past violations of Article 36. Thank you. Entonces, tengo el placer al presentar el doctor. It is my pleasure to present uh, Mr. Juan Carlos Vega. Mr. Juan Carlos Vega, you may, you may begin. We cannot hear you. Hi, my name is Juan Carlos Vega. I am, I am from Argentina. I am the attorney of Victor Salaño who is who has been in death row for 27 years. I have been his attorney for 23 years. Three things I would like to say and two proposals that I have 
this hearing is supposed to be to find means so that the U.S. can comply with precautionary measures and recommendations. Three previous clarifications that are of the essence here. First of all, for the U.S., the American Declaration on Human Rights, does it, is it, does it have bind, a binding effect or not? Number two, in the Saldano case, the racism has been proved in the imposition of his uh, death penalty. So there is racism in the US legal system, according to the commission, both in his first and his second conviction. A third clarification, what can we do to defend the commission in the face of the behavior of the US who are not complying with its recommendations and precautionary measures. Because it is clear that if the US fails to recognize the legal binding value of the American Declaration, which is the main cornerstone on which the commission acts, then what is the point of the US taking part in the Inter-American Commission or in the Inter-American inter System for Human Rights? This is a core question. If the American Declaration lacks any legal binding value for the US, then it makes no point for it to take part in the Inter-American System. So what are our proposals? Number one, take the Salgano case since Racism has been proven. It's the only case where judicial racism has been proven. Take the Saldano case as a precedent in the terms of the Anglo-Saxon system. Comply with the mandate of the commission, then transfer um, Saldano immediately to a mental hospital because that's where he should be. The president of Swearing versus the UK is very clear on that because after four years in, four, in death row, he was sent to a psychological institution. And our second proposal is for the US to comply with the second recommendation of the merits report and provide full reparations to the victims for 26 of years of um, torture and cruel penalty based on racism. If the US fails to do this, then the commission should apply its article 48 and article 59 chapter 4 point b that is all thank you very much okay i believe that uh, the civil society's participation has ended now so i will now give the floor to the uh, state for 20 minutes. Thank you very much, distinguished commissioners, civil society representatives, uh, representatives of the individuals on death row, and also to the members of the public who are following us. My name is Brad Fredden. I'm the uh, United States Interim Permanent Representative to the Organization of American States. And I'm pleased to be with you this afternoon. Uh, let me start out by saying that the United States strongly supports the work of the IACHR. And we regard the institution as vital to the promotion and protection of human rights in the Western Hemisphere. These public hearings play a key role in the American, excuse me, in the inter-American system to ensure that OAS member states are mindful of human rights challenges in their respective countries. We recognize the, that the United States, like all countries, has work to do. The US government is committed to advancing the promotion and protection of human rights of all persons. And today we're here to listen to any and all concerns. We are here at the invitation of the commission to discuss the death penalty and death row in the United States. 
Together with my colleague from the U.S. Department of Justice, we will provide information regarding the U.S. legal system and U.S. practices, U.S. Uh, practices and policies uh, for the commission's record and for civil society. Uh, beyond, uh, beyond that, we will um, um, note that the United States takes its commitments to the inter-American system, including its non-binding commitments under the American Declaration of the Rights and Dues of Man, very seriously. But we remind the Commission that in the United States view, the reports and recommendations of the Commission, as well as its recommendations for precautionary measures, are not binding on the United States under international law. Moreover, the United States would like to state for the record that we understand this to be a hearing of a general nature under Article 66 of the Commission's rules and not a petition-based hearing under Article 64. Today, since this is a hearing of a general nature, we are here to talk about our policies and practices generally. We are not in a position to discuss specific cases or answer questions about specific cases. I would now like to welcome my colleague, Richard Burns, Chief of the Capital Case Section in the Criminal Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, who's here with me today to address this important topic. Mr. Burns? Good afternoon. My name is Richard Burns, and I serve as the Chief of the Capital Case Section in the U.S. Department of Justice. I've been involved in litigating capital cases from both the defense and the prosecution sides for 28 years. I'd like to begin by thanking the commission for its important work in this area. Capital punishment continues to be a subject of vigorous debate within the United States. But I think everyone would agree that if we are to have a capital punishment system, it must be conducted with extreme care where our defendants' rights are scrupulously honored. Capital cases involve the severest punishment available under the law and have profound consequences for the accused and the victim's families. Everyone involved in such cases must ensure that all parties are treated fairly. Recognizing the significance of capital punishment, the United States has established legal systems designed to limit application of the death penalty to the most serious cases and to provide defendants with an extensive array of trial and appellate rights. As you know, the United States is governed by a federalist system. The US Constitution grants states broad powers to regulate their own general welfare, including enactment and enforcement of criminal laws, public safety, and corrections. Thus, the individual states retain primary responsibility for defining and enforcing the criminal laws, including those relating to the death penalty. Currently, 27 US states have the death penalty as a sentencing option, 23 do not. The federal government also has authority to prosecute some types of crimes, but its criminal jurisdiction is more limited than that of the states. On July 1st, 2021, Attorney General Garland issued a memorandum ordering a review of certain Department of Justice policies and procedures with regard to the federal death penalty. The memorandum directs the Deputy Attorney General to lead a multi-pronged review of recent policy changes to DOJ's capital case policies and procedures. That review will include a review of the addendum to the federal execution protocol adopted in 2019, a review to consider changes to DOJ regulations made in 2020 that expanded the permissible methods of execution and authorized the use of state facilities and personnel in federal executions and a review of recent changes to capital case provisions in DOJ's Justice Manual. The memorandum requires the reviews to include consultations with a wide range of stakeholders, including relevant DOJ components, other federal and state agencies, medical experts, and experienced capital counsel, amongst others. No federal executions will be scheduled while the reviews are pending. Uh, I prosecute cases in the federal system, so I do not have expertise in the particular laws applicable in each of the states. 
However, the death penalty systems established by both the federal and state governments must comply with the United States Constitution, so I can address constitutional requirements applicable to all capital cases. To begin, the, the Constitution prohibits state or federal governments making a death sentence mandatory for any crime. It also flatly prohibits capital punishment for certain categories of defendants, those who are insane, intellectually disabled, or who commit the crime before they turn the age of 18. For defendants not in those categories, their constitutional rights begin well before trial. Defendants are entitled to receive notice of the charges, which includes notice that the accused person is facing the possibility of capital punishment. Once charged, the accused is entitled to representation by legal counsel at every critical stage of the prosecution. If the accused is indigent, counsel is appointed at the government's expense. Prosecutors are required to provide the accused with discovery of its evidence, including any information that is potentially exculpatory as to either guilt or sentencing. The accused is entitled to a public trial at which he can confront the witnesses against him, present his own witnesses, and testify himself, though he cannot be compelled to testify should he choose to remain silent. He is entitled to be tried by a jury of his peers, and he can prevent a juror from being seated by exercising challenges to the juror's ability to be fair and impartial. The defendant is entitled to the assistance of experts at trial. If he cannot afford them, they will be provided at government expense. Such experts may cover issues such as DNA, fingerprints, ballistics testing, wrongful identification, mental health, medical examiner's reports, et cetera. The defendant is presumed to be innocent and can be found guilty only when the jury is unanimously convinced of his guilt by proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Even when a defendant is convicted of a murder, he or she is not legally eligible for capital punishment unless some additional factors usually called aggravating factors, are also established. Examples of such aggravating factors are that the crime was committed after substantial planning and premeditation to cause death, that the killing was committed in an especially heinous, cruel, or depraved manner, or that the defendant killed multiple victims or particularly vulnerable victims, such as children and the elderly. To meet constitutional standards, death penalty systems, whether in the states or the federal government, must narrow the category of defendants who are eligible for the death penalty. That purpose is accomplished by the court holding a sentencing hearing, which mirrors the guilt-innocence phase of trial. The prosecution presents evidence relating to the alleged aggravating factors. The defendant is again entitled to confront witnesses and present his own witnesses and evidence in mitigation. The jury is required to consider any relevant evidence the defendant offers in mitigation relating to the circumstances of the offense and or the character, record, and background of the defendant. A defendant's mental health, for example, or his impoverished upbringing often provide evidence and mitigation. The jury must be determine, again unanimously and beyond a reasonable doubt, whether any alleged aggravating factor is established. Absent such a finding, the defendant cannot be sentenced to death. If the jury does find an aggravating factor established, it then considers all the evidence, both aggravating and mitigating, to determine whether to impose a death sentence or a lesser sentence. If a death sentence is imposed at trial, the defendant is then entitled to a robust system of appeals. The United States appellate process affords those convicted of capital offenses the highest level of internationally recognized protection. The U.S. appellate process provides avenues for both state and federal court review of every criminal conviction. In addition, federal habeas corpus procedures enable federal courts to review the substantive and procedural merits of every death penalty sentence imposed by state courts. Appellate review in the United States ensures that defendants' trials are fair and impartial, that convictions are based on substantial evidence, and that sentences are proportionate to the crime. It is an individual's right to take full advantage of mandatory and discretionary appeals at the state and federal level, and is not uncommon that many years pass before this extensive appeals process is completed. Whether the case was prosecuted in the state court or federal, the defendant has the right to make a direct appeal, covering a wide range of potential legal issues that arose during the prosecution. 
If unsuccessful in his direct appeals, the defendant next has an opportunity to, to bring constitution-based claims of error in the federal courts via habeas petitions. Habeas petitions very often assert that the defendant received ineffective assistance of counsel at trial in violation of his Sixth Amendment rights. Such petitions begin at the federal district court level and can be appealed through the federal circuit courts and ultimately to the United States Supreme Court. If his habeas claim fails, the defendant may have opportunities to submit a subsequent habeas petition. Defendants can additionally go to the courts to challenge the competency to be executed and the method of execution. I've spoken thus far about general rules for capital cases imposed by the US Constitution. I'd like to mention briefly some additional rights for defendants in the federal court system. By federal law, a defendant charged with a capital crime has the right to appointment of at least two attorneys, one of whom must be learned in the law of capital cases. There is a federal public defender system that provides counsel to indigent defendants at no cost. And within the federal defender organization, there is a group of capital litigation specialists who provide training to counsel defending capital cases and as needed litigation assistance. The federal defender groups also maintain a list of private sector attorneys with capital case expertise who can be appointed to cases the federal defenders are not able to accept. Federal law also requires courts to instruct juries in capital cases that their decision on sentencing cannot be based on the defendant's or victim's race, color, religious beliefs, national origin, or sex, and requires the jurors to sign a certificate confirming that they followed that instruction. Federal law also entitles death sentence inmates to obtain post-conviction DNA testing of evidence. In addition to the many constitutional and statutory rights afforded capital defendants, the federal government's recognition of the seriousness of these cases led it to establish a set of Justice Department policies governing the process by which the department authorizes a case for capital prosecution. That process involves a multiple layer review of every potential capital case starting with the local U.S. Attorney's Office that charges the case, running through a centralized review by a Justice Department committee in Washington, D.C., and culminating in the Attorney General's personal decision whether to authorize a capital trial. During that review, irrelevant references to the defendant's or victim's race or ethnicity are removed from the material to minimize the risk that implicit bias may affect the decision. Additionally, the policy states that no final decision to seek a death sentence will be made without first giving the defense team a reasonable opportunity to present mitigating information for the department's consideration. Even after a case is authorized for capital trial, the defense may request withdrawal of the authorization based on changed facts and circumstances, and such requests are reviewed by the centralized committee in Washington and as warranted by the attorney general. I understand the commission is concerned with the potential impact lengthy periods of confinement may have on inmates sentenced to death. Courts in the United States have consistently rejected the argument that delay in execution can constitute cruel and unusual punishment under the US Constitution. Long periods of detention on death row are often the result of a constitutionally mandated exhaustive appeal process. This process exists to ensure the protection of other human rights including the right to a fair trial, the right to life, freedom from arbitrary arrest and imprisonment, and the right to due process of law. While detention on death row is likely physically and psychologically stressful for many capital prisoners, it is often lengthy because the United States provides numerous opportunities for further review to ensure that appropriate issues get adequate review by the court system. Though I am no expert on confinement issues, I understand that in January of 2016, the Justice Department announced the results of a, re of a review of use of restrictive housing in American prisons. The study concluded that there are occasions when correctional officers have no choice but to segregate inmates from the general population, typically when it is the only way to ensure the safety of inmates, staff, and the public. But as a matter of policy, the study noted that this practice should be used rarely, applied fairly, and subjected to reasonable constraints. The report includes a series of guiding principles for limiting the use of restrictive housing across the American criminal justice system, 
as well as specific policy changes that the Bureau of Prisons and other Justice Department components could undertake to implement these principles. Since the report was issued, the Bureau of Prisons has adopted the majority of the recommendations and continues to take steps to implement them and to ensure that inmates are housed in the least restrictive setting necessary to ensure their own safety and the safety of staff, other inmates, and the public. For example, the Bureau has a national policy designed to help ensure standardized and appropriate treatment to inmates with mental illness. The policy objectives include, among other things, identifying inmates with mental illness through screening, extending support for inmates with mental illness beyond traditional professional services through creation of supportive communities, specialized staff training, inmate peer support programs, care coordination teams, and institutions with specialized mental health missions, enhancing continuity of care through a network of accessible treatment providers when inmates transfer between institutions or to the community, and reducing the proportion of inmates with mental illness in restrictive housing settings. U.S. law also provides for federal oversight of state or locally run correctional facilities. Under the Civil Rights of Institutionalized Persons Act, the Special Litigation Section of the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division can investigate complaints concerning conditions in state or locally operated prisons, jails, and correctional facilities. When a pattern or practice of systemic deprivation of constitutional rights exists, the Civil Rights Division has the authority to initiate civil action against state or local officials to remedy the unlawful conditions. Inmates also have the right to file complaints about the conditions of confinement on such matters as inadequate medical care or deprivation of life's necessities, such as shelter, heat, clothing, sanitation, et cetera, which are then adjudicated through an administrative review process. After exhausting their potential administrative remedies, federal law permits inmates to file their claims in court under Title 42, United States Code Section 1983, asserting deprivation of their federal rights where they receive independent judicial review of their complaints. I hope my statement today demonstrates how the United States through its constitution, laws, and policies strives to implement this capital punishment systems with full respect for the rights of defendants from the time a case is charged to the time a sentence is carried out. Thank you for your time today. Muy bien, muchas gracias. Thank you. We have taken note of the intervention of the state and now we're going to give the floor to the Inter-American Commission for 20 minutes. And I will give the floor to the country reporter, Commissioner Roberta Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Alon, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, I want to start off by appreciating all of the information that has been shared with us uh, by both uh, the, the by both parties, and also to ask before I, I ask my questions, would it be possible for us to receive copies of your presentation? Um, in particular, uh, Mr. Burns, you gave us a lot of information about the legal regime and the policy regime around uh, the federal response to the death penalty. So it would be really useful if we can get a copy of that. Uh, I have just two or three questions. Um, we're here talking about the con conditions of confinement of persons on death row. And there is no contest that there are quite a few persons on death row who have been in solitary confinement for extreme, well, for very long periods of time. We've heard of 27 years, 23 years. And uh, those conditions are characterized by the almost complete absence of human contact, uh, absence of um, ability to be outside of a rather small cell for 23 hours a day. And the, 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 the prison conditions have been well described. Um, I was struck, um, Mr. Burns, by your uh, assurance that the, um, the US state take very seriously its human rights obligations. And, and to, to quote you, you said, you treat the death penalty with uh, extreme care. I think those were the words that we used. And rights are scrupulously protected. 
Um, you also took us through a, a tour, uh, a summary of the legal regime related to the, 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 the protection of human rights of persons on death row. And I suppose what I really want to ask, and I think it's at the heart of the question, under the, um, the, the US Constitution, while CS delay does not is, has been held not to constitute cruel and unusual punishment, what is the legal regime or what is the what is the jurisprudence on confinement of 27 years whilst on death penalty? And I understand also the point being that persons may be on death row for a long periods of time because they're exhausting uh, domestic remedies and appeals processes and so on. But of course, you can be in protracted processes, but not held in solitary confinement and not in solitary confinement where you're also denied or not receiving medical care. So I, I would sort of just like to get a sense of what the jurisprudence is around solitary confinement and violative of constitutional rights. Um, in relation to the question of uh, Mr. Serrano reason, and the, I, yes, we do understand that this is a, a hearing of, 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 of some generality, but Mr. Serrano raised some points specific to his um, his father, and he he's raising the question of the denial of access to health care. Um, uh, his father is also suffering from mental illness, and so my question, and he's also raised the prospect that, and to which you yourself, I think, affirmed, Mr. Burns, that the federal government there is a capacity to engage with the state where federal rights have been violated. And specifically in relation to what Mr. Saran has offered us today, he says that his father's rights under the ADA, I think that Americans Living with Disabilities Act, have been violated, but the federal government is not enforcing um, the rights under that act. So I would also like to get some reflection on, on, on you know, how this ADA can be uh, triggered for persons who are on death row, in solitary confinement, suffering from mental illness, denied medical treatment, how can that um, that provision be accessed? I have some other questions, but I'll stop here because I know the other commissioners also have questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Clark. I will give the floor to Commissioner Joel Hernandez. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, for the opportunity to intervene at this hearing. I would like to greet the representatives of the civil society and the state for their presence. I completely agree with the state as to the nature of this hearing. This is a hearing that is within section as Article 62 of the Rules of Procedure of the Commission and has as its purpose the exchange of information between the interested parties and the Commission for the better understanding of the problems. There is no doubt as to the uh, how useful these hearings are, and I really acknowledge the presence of the authorities of the United States because one of the main objectives of the Commission is to hold a dialogue and we call upon all the member states of the OAS to uh, come to these hearings. I would also like to greet the attorneys and public attorneys and the lawyers who have, uh, who are uh, with the cases of people who are sentenced to death because we know that Poverty is a condition in many of these cases, and these are people that do not have the resources in order to have a technical defense by their own means. It is also of essence to underscore the advances made in the US and in the region to abolish death penalty. I have to recognize a fact here, which is, the sovereignty that each state has in order to be able to decide on the legality or not of death penalty, but the world and the international com community and a number of countries in the national international community have moved forward toward the abolition of death penalty, precisely because it is considered as an arbitrary deprivation of uh, life and 
permanence in the death row has been considered a cruel or inhuman treatment. In that sense, I have heard with interest certain advances in order to limit death penalty in the US, I believe it is um, a progress that people that have a mental disorder or uh, minors are not subject to, would not be subject to death penalty. It's also significant that 23 states have abolished death penalty. But I believe it is also important to keep moving forward on a shared objective towards the uh, internal part of the commission and it is to abolish death penalty. In this hearing, which is under the framework of merits report adopted by the commission, and precautionary measures. It is not our purpose to analyze each of them, but it is our purpose to establish certain characteristics. And in the merit reports has established international re responsibility due to failures in due process of law against people who are sentenced to death, including inhumane and cruel treatment, which is to be in the death row. I would also like to say that this is not the space to speak about the legal nature of the recommendations of the commission, whether it, it is in the merits report or in the recommendations, but I would like to uh, say what was uh, repeat what was said by the Inter American Commission in its uh, advisory opinion 20, and uh, where it says that this is international customary law, but it is also more important to remind you of the fact that the Inter American Court has. Um, recommended state to comply with the recommendations of the state. And I mention as a source the Inter-American Commission because one of the complementary sources of right are the advisory opinion of the courts, in this case, an international court which is specialized in human rights of our region, the Inter-American Court. So I would like to conclude with a question for the state, which has to do with getting to know which are the measures that the US is taking, in particular, the Secretary of State in order to communicate the uh, state authorities the precautionary measures uh, issued by the commission. The precautionary measures are of essence in order to protect the physical integrity of people who are in the death corridor and it would be in the death row, sorry, and it would be important to get to know the way in which the US is acting in order to follow out the measures dictated by the commission. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. We also have at this hearing Special Rapporteur for ESC ER Rights, Soledad Garcia Muñoz. So I'm going to give her the floor now. Thank you very much, Commissioner and Rapporteur for persons deprived of their liberties and president of this hearing. I would like to greet you, the country Rapporteur, Commissioner Clark, and Commissioner Hernandez as well as the Honorable State, the United States of America, and all the representatives of the civil society. I would like to greet you all and thank you for the important work you will do in the defense of the human rights of those um, who have been um, convicted to death penalty in the US. I would like to say again that I hope that one day soon uh, death penalty will be ab uh, abolished in that beautiful country. And I must say that I heard concern 
all the different um, arguments or retellings, in particular with regards to the health conditions that affect, of course, the economic and social rights of persons deprived of their liberties and convicted to death in the US. And I agree with Commissioner Clark and ask about what specific measures is the state implementing to address those um, health situations, in particular, those we've heard about at this hearing, which were quite specific, and those that have to do with the merits reports issued by that commission. Those 10 merits reports also show because of the profile of those involved and um, on death uh, row, they show certain um, factors that could lead to the um, application of death penalty. And that, considering my mandate, I find quite concerning the socioeconomic and racial aspects at play here. Mr. Barnes was explaining the checks and balances that exist to prevent that from happening. We know that no legal system is perfect, but the figures are quite telling if we consider the um, racial or uh, socioeconomical factors that might be at play here. So I would like to urge everyone to take those factors into account. And maybe this is not the right time to discuss this, but maybe we should assess the legal value of the um, commission's recommendations. But I would like to establish that advisory opinion number 10 issued by the court on the interpretation of the declaration. The court recognized the legal value of the declaration as the instrument that by nature should be taken into account to comply with the um the um compromises or sorry the everything that was um that is projected if for those states who uh, are bound by the um american charter so thank you very much thank you very much and as um commissioner and rapporteur for persons deprived of their liberties and uh, against torture. I would like to share a couple of reflections. I would like to say that the commission has addressed the issue of death penalty as a vital challenge in terms of human rights in the past 26 years. In 2011, the commission published a thematic report in which it declared its specific report and an interest in this issue and once this report was uh, published, there had already been several situations in cases with the US, Cuba, and other countries in the region. And right now the commission, right then the commission had also addressed the imposition of the penalty in some countries in the Caribbean. It is clear that uh, death penalty is being more and more questioned in those countries that still, some, still have it. There are several situations presented by the civil society around this issue. For example, the fact that the application implies the risk of convicting to death an innocent party, for example, or there had also been reflections about how certain legal errors might make these convictions arbitrary or unfair, or even the cost it means for judiciary systems. Uh, all the years people have to spend um, in prison while they wait for the, com for the execution. So the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights has tried to develop standards on the penalty that define its restrictions, its prohibitions in accordance to several human rights instruments that should be applied by the states in the region. With that in mind, the commission has examined 
a great number of petitions and precautionary measures requests that seek to remedy and protect the human rights of persons convicted to death. But while the development of these human rights standards has been careful, they have not been as effective as expected when we consider that this penalty causes irreversible damage in lives. And that is why these kinds of hearings are useful. They are necessary so that all stakeholders will be active in their search for the effective application of human rights standards, which are more and more necessary in this issue. So as Commissioner Joel Hernandez said, I am sure of the importance of this hearing. And I think we've heard from both parties very important arguments. So with this, we will close the commission's intervention in this part of the hearing. And now we will move on to give 12 minutes to the representatives of the civil society to um, speak. So I will now give the floor once again to them for 12 minutes. Mr. Amanoff, do you want to get us started? Good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Amanoff, and I represent Lesbian Mitchell in case 13570 and Julius Robinson in case 13361. Um, notwithstanding the United States' constitution, laws, and policies, in both cases, the Commission issued precautionary measures and merits reports, which found in favor of the petitioners and recommended the United States government bar their executions and conduct new trials. The Commission also recommended that the United States initiate an investigation into the legality of the federal death penalty. As the Commission carefully documented in its 2011 report on the death penalty, enforcement and implementation of the Commission's reports and precautionary measures has been a continuing problem. One of the issues is that the United States Supreme Court has previously held that the decisions of international tribunals are not binding on non-federal entities in the United States. For this reason, we sought the commission's intervention in Mitchell and Robinson's cases because these are federal death penalty cases. But despite the United States' participation in the litigation before this commission, the United States continues to ignore the commission's rulings. Indeed, the United States government has now executed at least four people, Juan Garza, Orlando Hall, Lisa Montgomery, and our client, Lesman Mitchell, notwithstanding precautionary measures and merits decisions in those people's favors. Robinson remains on federal death row, and the government thus far has refused to engage in settlement discussions despite our repeated invitations to do so. The United States federal government executed 13 people between July 2020 and January 2021. Given the commission's continuing concerns about race as expressed in the 2011 report and in the merits reports in both Mitchell and Robinson's cases, it should be no surprise that the majority of those executed were people of color and the majority of federal death row today is made up of people of color who were tried before primarily white juries. In Robinson's case in particular, the commission expressed concern about the federal government's charging practices. The decision-making process by which the Department of Justice decides to seek the death penalty is largely confidential. Also confidential is the decision-making process that goes into deciding which cases to deauthorize from capital charges and the plea agreement process. As a result, although petitioners like Robinson are able to point to a discriminatory effect in terms of racial minorities receiving more death sentences, the shroud of confidentiality prevents petitioners from establishing discriminatory intent as is required to succeed on such claims in the domestic courts. Given the United States' refusal to implement the changes that the commission has outlined and their extreme action of executing petitioners like Mitchell, whose human rights this commission has found were violated, we are calling on the commission to facilitate a discussion between the parties to try to resolve these issues. We believe that in addition to the specific recommendations that the commission has already made in the published reports in these cases, the United States should commit to total transparency in terms of charging and resolving death penalty prosecutions and all aspects of the lethal injection, lethal injection and execution date setting processes. They must commit to an open file policy such that all decisions can be reviewed by defense teams. 
In addition, DOJ should submit to a thorough investigation of its death penalty procedures by a neutral third party with the goal of ensuring that racial bias, be it implicit or explicit, has not invaded the death penalty decision-making process and to explain the discriminatory effect that we see in the death row population and in the racial makeup of capital juries. Finally, it is clear that certain administrations have been particularly aggressive in seeking the death penalty and executing those convicted. This demonstrates the arbitrariness of the death penalty process in the United States. While the DOJ has temporarily paused executions while it conducts a confidential review of some of the past administration's actions, that pause could end at any moment and executions could restart as they did last year. I'd also like to note that notwithstanding Mr. Burns' referral to a moratorium, DOJ is currently pursuing capital prosecutions at trial and defending death sentences on appeal and in post-conviction. In order to permanently alleviate arbitrariness and rem remedy the discriminatory effect, we call on DOJ, DOJ to pursue settlement and resentencing and recommend executive clemency in cases like Mr. Robinson's. I'd like to cede my remaining time to Professor Cesare Romano to further address the importance of member states respecting the commission's actions. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, I'm here speaking uh, both as a person who has been assisting Jonathan Aminoff and his colleagues in his work on the Julius Robinson case and the Mitchell case. That's the formal reason I'm here. But I think I'm also here because I am a, an expert on international uh, human rights and specifically on international adjudicative institutions. And lastly, I'm speaking from Los Angeles. So last week here in Los Angeles, the United States hosted the Summit of the Americas. And we know 23 leaders from throughout the Western Hemisphere gathered here to discuss common issues faced by all states in this hemisphere. Amongst the challenges that they discussed was the question of the erosion of democracy in our hemisphere and the dramatic inroads that countries that do not care for democracy and human rights are making in our continent. I would like to make a statement that I'm sure is not going to shock anyone in this meeting, is that it's in the US national interest to support the work of the Inter-American Commission. Actually, at the beginning of the meeting, I heard Mr. Freden saying and repeating that the US does support the Inter-American Commission. But does it? Well, I beg to defer. Like we are all here representing cases where the United States has been requested by the Inter-American Commission to do certain things or not to do certain things. And the reply that comes repeatedly from the Department of Justice and the State Department is stonewalling and complete disregard to the recommendations of the commission. I would like to say that that is not engaging with the commission, that is not supporting the commission. Paying the bills, of the Organization of American States and the Commission is not enough. The United States must support its institutions. Every time the United States refuses to engage with the Commission in finding a pragmatic way forward to settle the human rights cases that are brought to its attention, it undermines it. Every time it refuses to listen to the Commission, it provides an easy alibi to nations in Latin America and the Caribbean that are enabled then to do the same. Let's remind, remember this. International institutions are not a limitation of sovereignty. They are a multiplier of sovereignty because through international institutions, states can achieve goals that they cannot achieve easily by themselves. Even the United States needs strong international institutions to help it achieve its goals, which is protection of democracy and human rights in America, in the Western Hemisphere, hemisphere and throughout the world. Now, make no mistake, I'm not saying that the United States should start treating the reports of the Inter-American Commission as legally binding. That is a red herring, that discussion. The United States can engage constructively with the Commission without conceding that general legal point. It can do so as a matter of committee, but most of all, it needs to start doing that as a matter of national self-interest. Thank you. Honorable commissioners, uh, members of the secretariat and experts, thank you and good afternoon.
My name is Sandra Babcock. I represent five of the victims in this proceeding, Jose Losa, Felix Rocha Diaz, uh, Erica Shepard, Melissa Lucio, and Krista Pike. I'd like to start by thanking the commission for its vigilant monitoring of the rights of prisoners sentenced to death in the United States over the last several decades. You might feel sometimes that your work has no impact when you see that prisoners are executed after you've issued precautionary measures or merits recommendations, but I assure you that is not the case. Your work has saved lives and you have built the most important body of jurisprudence on the application of the death penalty in the world. But most important, you are often the only body that has ever recognized the human rights violations that undermine the dignity and due process rights of our clients. You give them hope. And for that, we thank you. I'd also like to thank the United States uh, in particular for its efforts, both behind the scenes and in the courts on behalf of Mexican nationals facing the death penalty, whose rights were affected under the Avena judgment. Um, we are particularly grateful for your work in the case of Jose Losa. I think that the presence of the United States in this hearing also gives us hope that this is a new opportunity for reassessment of how the United States has engaged with the commission and whether it's time for a change. President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris are openly opposed to the death penalty and this is a first in US history. It's time for the United States to think about how it can creatively and proactively seek to implement the commission's recommendations and precautionary measures. And there are so many ways that you can do this, even without abandoning your long held legal position that the commission's recommendations are not legally binding, a position that we would urge you to reconsider. But even if you don't, there are things you can do. You can file amicus briefs in state courts where you urge state courts to accept and implement the commission's recommendations out of deference and comedy. You can file letters with clemency authorities, urging them to do the same. You can make personal visits um, and meet with authorities, both in state attorney general's office, offices who are responsible for conditions of confinement in those states uh, and who are responsible for overseeing capital cases in their jurisdiction. You can support congressional action to repeal provisions of the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act that curtail the power of the federal courts to review the merits of federal habeas corpus petitions. This legislation alone poses the greatest structural obstacle to implementation of the commission's merits recommendations and in and of itself constitutes a violation of prisoners' rights to access judicial remedies. Finally, I would encourage the United States to consider creating a national human rights institution whose mandate is to, would encompass the treatment of cases brought before the commission. It is particularly problematic, I think, that officials who are responsible for implementing and defending the application of the death penalty in the United States are engaged in the treatment and response to the petitions filed by victims before this commission. Uh, in the meantime, before a national human rights institution is adopted, uh, it would be worth reconsidering whether this is the appropriate approach to cases before the commission. Thank you very much. Muy bien, muchas gracias. Thank you. So, we have heard the representatives of the beneficiaries. Now we will listen to the state for 12 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, I have to say that we appreciate uh, opportunities such as today's hearing uh, to engage with the IACHR and with civil society. Um, I found the uh, the presentations by the commissioners and the and the representatives of civil society uh, to be both. Uh, thoughtful and compelling. Um, and I would say that um, we are all, uh, we're all human and we all 
uh, when it comes to to uh, things like uh, treating people decently and humanely, um, we all feel that this is uh, an imperative. Um, we feel that um, where there are shortcomings in our country, we try to remedy them. And the, um, this process, this iterative process that we have with the commission is part of that. Change comes, as, as, as change is evolutionary. And, and I think uh, you, you've mentioned, the commissioner mentioned one of the, uh, the, the changing policies under the Biden administration. Uh, but as you know, we, we have a federal system. And so uh, you know, real change comes from the courts, it comes from legislatures, but it also comes from uh, engagements like this one. We will take your questions uh, and your input back for consideration. Uh, and to the extent feasible, uh, we will um, um, try to provide you answers uh, consistent with our longstanding views on the, on the um, non-binding nature of the, of the recommendations. I mean, that, that the, the issue of binding, non-binding is, uh, we've, we've touched on it several times and, and I, I think the U.S. position is quite clear, so no need to, to, to say it again. But um, as we stated at the outset of this hearing uh, and in pro, uh, prior communication with the commission, um, we're not in a position to go into details on individual cases, uh, nor are you asking us to today. Um, but I would note that the United States uh, receives a final report and recommendations uh, whenever we receive uh, a, a final report uh, and recommendations or, or precautionary measures resolution from the commission. Um, my office, the, the, the uh, USOAS, transmits it immediately to the relevant state or federal authority uh, for consideration and asks that it be taken under advisement. So uh, no recommendation of the commission goes um, um, unheard by those for, to whom it is intended, uh, for whom it is intended. Uh, we, we're um, uh, we take that responsibility uh, quite seriously. Um, so just in closing, I guess on behalf of the U.S. delegation, I want to take this opportunity to renew um, the appreciation of our government for the role of the IACHR in reviewing the human rights practices of member states, um, including our own, and uh, thank all those present today for your tireless efforts working on these very difficult issues. Thank you very much. Muy bien, entiendo que él estaba terminado su Okay, I guess the state has finished its intervention. I will ask then my colleagues whether you have additional comments before closing the hearing. Okay, if there are no comments, I would like to underscore that the commission hopes this hearing can be a turning point in the development of a joint strategy in order to comply with different strategies that we have made. And if more petitions come to us, we will keep on uh, working on them. The commission is proposing to create a proactive joint agenda together with the state, the representatives of the big victims, so as to promote the compliance with certain recommendations in specific cases, in some cases of merits reports and precautionary measures. I would like to invite you as well, invite the state to take into consideration the information shared on this hearing. And I hope that there can be a follow-up strategy for the implementation of the recommendations. And I believe that 
is crucial to follow up these recommendations in order to avoid uh, violating human rights and to be able to move forward towards the compliance of this agenda. Uh, without further ado, then I would like to close this hearing and I would like to thank all the people who are present here. Thank you. Thank you very much.